awkward. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Jake Newcomb is a master's student at Rutgers uh, studying entomology. He has worked with the NJDI and aquatic entomologists and has developed a deep understanding and appreciation for aquatic systems in the process. He visits ponds and streams in his spare time and he enjoys reading papers about the specimens that he finds in his travels. So Jake, you're all good to share. All right. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes. All right. Uh, do I need to run <clears throat> presentation mode? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. There you better? go. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So, as Jen so politely introduced me, my name is Jake Newcomb. I'm a grad student finishing up my last semester at Rutgers University. And in my time, I'm very grateful to have studied under. Uh, one of the greatest aquatic entomologists in the United States. And he taught me a lot uh, about the systems, uh, the species, the diversity, and their, their interactions. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'd like to say first, it might be obvious to a lot of people, but what is an aquatic insect? Uh, an aquatic insect has either one stage, two stages, all of its stages in water. That can be the it lives in the water, but it doesn't breathe air. It can live on the water. It can hold its breath and swim underwater. It's the idea that there's an insect that inhabits water or it lives near water. So the diversity of aquatic insects is pretty important. There's more than uh, 10 orders of insects containing aquatic species. That surprises a lot of people. And there's more than 100,000 different aquatic species. Uh, and depending on the species you look at, each of them exploit different niches. We have scavengers, we have predators, we have herbivores. We have a lot of different niches to be exploited in different habitats in our aquatic systems. And a lot of these aquatic insects are important food sources for larger animals. And we'll get more into that as we discuss. Why should we care? Well. Like I said in the previous slide, they are an important food source. They're important to a lot of fish, birds, rodents, a lot of wildlife depend on aquatic insects to obtain nutrients. On top of that, a lot of these scavenger insects, which I'll explain more as we go, actually recycle the nutrients that fall into these aquatic systems. You have fallen trees, you have leaf litter, you have decaying carcasses, a lot of these pieces of matter that wouldn't normally be broken down are then converted into energy and then insect material, which is then in another food source for these animals. They're also important bioindicators. Uh, a lot of these insects are highly sensitive to water quality changes or low water quality. And we'll get more into that as well. Uh, they're decent water filterers they can actually improve water quality. They can remove a lot of contaminants or toxic materials, depending on the species. And a lot of people don't know this, but there are aquatic pollinators. Um, fun fact, water striders, while they live on the water, actually have a winged variant that will leave the pond in order to disperse to other areas. And in doing so, they also pollinate while they do that. And lastly, they're fun. I think I have a particular bias doing this, but I think that I could convince anybody that insects are pretty fun, especially aquatic ones. So a lot of these insects have modifications in order to survive in these aquatic environments. Firstly, we have natatorial legs. Natatorial coming from the derivative word to swim. Uh, if you've ever looked at a diving beetle or a uh, back swimmer, you will see that their legs are modified to move quickly underwater. And one of the things that benefits them to do so are modified setae or insect hairs. You'll see fine rows of hairs running along their legs that allow them to paddle really quickly. Some of these setae are actually used on their body as well. And I'll get into that in a sec. There are also water jets. Fun fact, aquatic dragonflies or excuse me, dragonfly nymphs are actually aquatic and they move around by pumping water through their anus in order to escape predators 
or to move to another area. There are also waterproof silk and adhesives that they use to tether to certain areas or high velocity environments. In terms of respiration, there are a lot of gills. We see a lot of gills in different orders of insects. We see them in mayflies, we see them in stoneflies, dragonflies, and so on. And this is actually really important adaptation because prior to this, insects breathe air. We see siphons as well. This is a really cool um, modification where all of these spiracles or breathing at a, a, a holes on an insect have moved to the back of the body in a snorkel fashion. You'll see uh, water lurkers, toe biters, or water bugs, and several other different hemipterans will actually sit at the surface of the water and breathe the air, and then they will hold their breath and swim underwater as well. And air capture, as I mentioned before, some of these modified setae or hairs are on their body. They have a thick enough mat of hairs that allows them to capture air. You'll see this in diving beetles. You'll see this in water spiders. You'll see this in a lot of different groups. And it actually enables them to breathe underwater using that bubble. It's sort of like a miniature scuba tank. And one of my favorite adaptations that you rarely see is what's known as endophyte attachment. There are a lot of different ways that these insects obtain oxygen that we've talked about, but particularly the most interesting one is where an insect will actually attach itself to a plant and their spiracle will fixate on the vascular system of the plant and obtain oxygen that way. There are not too many insects that do this. They're mostly true fly larvae or pupae, but still really cool. We also have to talk about the environments that these insects live in. There's two major subgroups. There's lentic and lotic. To put it simply, it's either still water or moving water. And it may seem simple, but there are a lot of different modifications to these environments that these insects adapt to. And we'll get more into that in a sec. Here we have the anatomy of a lentic habitat. You see the littoral zone. This is where light enters the pond. And this is the majority of where plants will grow. In the sublittoral zone, plants will also grow, but not nearly as much. You have down here, the profundal zone. This is where light reaches about 1% or less uh, in terms of intensity. You'll have some insects down here, but not too many. It's usually burrowing insects. Majority of insects that you'll see in a lentic environment are close to the surface within the littoral zone. You'll see them in the plants, you'll see them in the soil, in the, in the lake, or you'll see them swimming on or near the surface. Now, perhaps one of my favorite things to talk about is a lotic habitat. Now, the diagram you see is a very simplified version of a river or a stream, but to boil it down, there are pools, and there are riffles. There are a series of erosional zones that uh, coincide with low erosion, um, low velocity, high volume, and high erosion, high velocity, low volume. The pool is a very slow moving current. It often has very small sediment and a lot of water is moving through it at once. And you have the riffle. The riffle is large rocks, large pieces of sediment, very fast moving water. If you've ever seen rapids in a river, if you go to the Delaware River and you see those massive red rocks sticking out with white water, that is a riffle. And 90% of aquatic insects in a river or stream will be found in a riffle because it's just such an advantageous environment for these insects to live in. It allows them to capture a lot of nutrients because a lot of water is moving through a small space and it provides a lot of oxygen in order for them to survive and respirate. Now, we have to talk about the limiting factors in an insect's survival. Like I said before, water quality is a major thing. If there are too many chemicals or too many things wrong with the water, insects will not thrive there. They will just die. Temperature is important. The groundwater in New Jersey is a very specific temperature. 
And if that changes too quickly or too much, it can also cause the insects to die. As I said, oxygen levels are very important. Animals need oxygen in order to survive. And if a lake or a pond goes anoxic because too many organisms were taking up too many oxygen, the insects will suffocate. Available habitat. If something has been destroyed, if a riffle that insects previously inhabited has just been taken apart, the rocks were kicked, or for whatever reason, it just came apart, they can no longer survive. Some insects are adapted specifically to live in riffles, these high speed environments, rather than the pools. And they will just die off if they cannot find another similar environment. And the abundance of predators. As you know, with any high population of predators, there's going to be a downtick on the population of prey. So now we're gonna talk about habitat orientation. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of different niches that these insects will fill, and it depends on the environments they live in. We're first gonna talk about clingers. These ones are really cool. Clingers are most often found in the riffles I previously mentioned due to the high oxygen rates of the moving water, but they can also occasionally be, find, be found in highly oxygenated lakes, but that is much less common. They often attach themselves to substrate, but they can also cling to the substrate. They sometimes use glue, as I mentioned before, the adhesion, or they have some sort of suction device in order to remain attached. The three insects I have pictured in this, the first one at the top right being a water penny larvae. It's a water penny beetle larvae. We have in the middle photo, a black fly larvae, and we have in the bottom, a flat rock mayfly nymph. And all three of these insects use some sort of modified disc in order to attach themselves to the substrate. Black flies will also occasionally use a silk tether. If they get knocked off or if they have to escape prey, they'll tether out and then find a way back. Uh, they also have modifications. They're very streamlined in order to reduce water friction. You can imagine in very fast moving water, I mean, even humans can get wrinkly and worn down. So these insects have to be very smooth and streamlined in order to avoid that kind of damage. And a lot of them are filter feeders with all of this water, all of this oxygen and all of these nutrients flowing through these rocks. There are a lot of microorganisms, there's a lot of algae and a lot of, excuse me, detritus that accumulates on these large stones. And things like this mayfly larvae and this water penny beetle larvae will either feed on the detritus, the algae, or the microorganisms, or they will feed on things that feed on those. Next up, we talk about crawlers. Some of these are somewhat subjective. A crawler can sometimes be considered a clinger, and a clinger can sometimes be considered a crawler based on certain behaviors they have. But what differentiates a crawler is usually the fact that they are not in that high speed environment. They are not actively tethering themselves in order to remain motionless or to remain attached to the rock. They, they like to be active on different substrates. This is usually in ponds or lakes, but they can also be found in rivers, usually in the slower moving pools. And that includes sunken logs, sediments, leaf litter, and other different pieces of material that may find themselves in the substrate. They, like I said, they have adaptations to remain in strong currents occasionally, but these adaptations are usually better adapted to move around. So the first picture in the top right is a perla stonefly. This is an active crawler. They can live in high velocity environments, but they can also live in the low velocity pools and occasionally live in uh, still water. Uh, in the second photo, we have a really cool catus fly uh, from the family Goridae. Now, what's special about Gorids? I haven't talked about catus flies yet, but each catus fly species, family, genus uses a different material specific to that species to build their cases. And this one in particular uses, always uses two large sets of rocks on either side in order to anchor themselves into the substrate or onto the rocks so they don't get swept away. And below this, one of my favorite insects 
it's a dragonfly nymph known as Haganus. This is also, if you want to look it up, known as the dragon hunter. It is a highly cannibalistic dragonfly that actually mimics leaf litter. And if you go to Sandy Banks in Northern New Jersey and you look in the pools and it hasn't stormed recently, there's a minor chance that you'll find one of these massive, beautiful dragonfly nymphs. And they're so very cool. Next, we talk about burrowers. These are also really cool. They reside in soft benthic substrate, benthic meaning at or below uh, the surface of the bottom of the pond or any other body of water. And usually they filter feed, they're going through a lot of this substrate and they're filtering out bacteria, detritus, fungus, anything that they can feed on while they're cleaning this substrate. But uh, occasionally it can also be ambush predators. One of my really cool collections has this in the top right, a Cordula gastrid dragonfly. Now this waits in the soil, it is an ambush predator. And I'll talk about this in a little bit, but they have a unique modification that allows them to strike at anything that moves past. They're very voracious predators. They can be found at the bottoms of lakes in the profundal zone where no light grows. But this is less common and usually restricted to uh, the um, scavengers like the burrowing mayfly pictured as well. You'll notice a really cool modification. The bottom right picture is a close up of the mayfly in the central picture. Now they have these are gills that you're looking at, and they're highly modified in order to obtain oxygen from the substrate. They're very filamentous, and they reach out in as many different uh, directions as possible to obtain a lot of oxygen. Next, we talk about climbers. These are very simple. They're usually found in non-moving water, but they can also be found in the pools of, of rivers or uh, streams. They're big identifier is that they climb on vegetation, hence the name. They climb up, they climb down, they climb side to side, and there's not much more to it than that, but they have adaptations on their limbs. They usually have one or two claws that allow them to hold on and move very quickly. And they usually have a modification that allows them to swim away because being climbers on vegetation, they're a little bit more visible to predators, particularly fish. In the top photo, we have a damselfly nymph. And these are the modified gills I was talking about earlier. The, the gills extend from the back of the mayfly and this is how it obtains oxygen. And they'll occasionally use this as a back fin in order to swim around. And below that is a dragonfly nymph. As I mentioned before, they use their anus as a water jet. And if you see the three spines on its back, those are what envelop its anus and they'll actually squeeze the water out of their body in order to move forward and escape predators. They also have internal gills that they use this pump in order to move water over and allow them to breathe. We also have swimmers. These are probably the most identifiable if you ask any person if they've seen an aquatic insect. And these are the modifications that I was talking about earlier. The, if you can see in the top right photo, you can see on the ends of those legs, modified paddles that allow them to swim around. You can see this on the Dytiscus beetle on the bottom picture as well. They're very active. They're usually predatory or scavengers and they move very quickly. Oftentimes they breathe air and they capture air on their underside or under their wings. And then they swim around until they have to come back up to breathe. And they occasionally will cling to vegetation if they feel they have to hide or rest. Now up next is a really fun picture. Uh, I've already talked about a lot of different aquatic adaptations, like what do these insects do to be better to survive in the water? But here we see a water scavenger beetle preying on a back swimmer. Um, and what's interesting about this is that the scavenger beetle larvae has actually removed the back swimmer from the water so that it cannot swim away. It cannot disrupt the predation. 
by trying to swim away. It is using its own adaptation against it. And this is one of the things that makes aquatic entomology so cool. Next, we have floaters. If you've ever seen a mosquito in the water, and I know some of us are very familiar with mosquitoes, you'll see that they actually float at the surface. Now, it doesn't always have to be at the surface. It could be anywhere on the surface of the water where light hits. Some of them will reside below the surface. It could be six inches, it could be a foot, um, but they are adapted to live in that area. They usually have trapped gas that allow them to float back up to or near the surface of the water. And they can obtain oxygen in two different ways. They usually obtain oxygen through a siphon, like I mentioned before, you can see the mosquito in the bottom picture doing that, or they use cutaneous oxygen absorption. The ghost midge in the top right photo will actually absorb oxygen cutaneously through the water. So we also have swimmers, skaters, sorry, not swimmers, skaters or skimmers. Um, you guys have definitely seen this before. They inhabit the water's surface and they have modified hairs on their feet that prevent them from breaking the surface tension of the water. If you look at the water measurer insect in the top right photo, you'll actually see it's stepping on the water and the water looks like it is dipping under it. And you'll see that it isn't actually going through the water. Uh, these usually are scavenger insects. They will feed on in other insects that have drowned in the water and they're floating at the surface. A lot of these are hemipterans or true bugs like the water skaters or in the picture, the water measurer. But we have springtails as well. Uh, that is the insect in the bottom right picture. They will also not break the surface tension. They require high humidity. So they will remain on the surface of the water in order to survive. So water quality is less important for these uh, skaters because they are not absorbing the water as much. They are not breathing the water. They are only residing on the surface of it. And you need much higher levels of these toxic chemicals or other substances in order to kill these insects. So you'll often find them in the lower quality environments where you won't find other insects. So we'll go very quickly through the different aquatic insect orders. I wasn't able to list all of them because of the time that we have, but I'll go into detail about the ones that we discussed. I'll first go into my favorite dragonflies, otherwise known as Odonata or Odonata which denotes their massive teeth. If you look in the bottom right, you'll see a very interesting appendage coming out of the damselfly's mouth, excuse me, dragonfly's mouth. It is actually a modified labium. The bottom part of the insect's mouth part has been modified to the extent that can actually extend out and grab their prey. Uh, this is one of the animals that actually inspired alien uh, that has the mouth that comes out from the from the back of its throat. And this is a really interesting adaptation that a lot of people don't know about. They're obligate predators, they're hyper predators, and their nymphs are aquatic. You've seen dragonfly adults before, but a lot of people haven't seen these. And as I mentioned, the dragonfly nymphs have the internal gills fed by the water pump, and the damselflies have the gills on the outside that allow them to obtain oxygen just by moving water around. Next, we go into mayflies, known as ephemeroptera or short-lived wings. This is one of the oldest, if not the oldest group of aquatic insects. Uh, there are even uh, photos of them, not that this would be as ancient as they are, but there are photos, not photos, uh, paintings of mayflies emerging from Egypt, from Africa and these cave paintings or archeological paintings display massive numbers of these insects. You can see in the bottom right, a gas station in the Midwest that was just absolutely taken over by these insects. They emerge in such large numbers that it can just overwhelm an entire town. Now, these are one of the hypersensitive species. So if it happens one year, a single change in the water quality can prevent this from happening again. Another interesting thing about these insects is that they have two winged adult stages. 
They have a sub imago, which is a winged mayfly that isn't actually able to reproduce yet. And then they molt into an imago or a sexually mature mayfly ready to mate. And these mayflies only live between about 24 hours to 48 hours. They mate and then they die. If you've ever talked to a fly fisherman, you'll hear the term spinner. It's usually denoting a male mayfly that spins out of the sky after it dies. And it's really cool to see. Next, we talk about plecopteras. I mentioned them briefly, but they're, they're known as stoneflies. And they're called stoneflies uh, because of the way that they climb out onto the stones in order to molt and emerge. They are obligate fresh water. They breathe water. They inhabit mostly the benthic zone, meaning they are mostly on the ground, on the substrate, in the water. They can be crawlers. Occasionally, they'll be climbers. And a lot of them are clingers as well. They really prefer high oxygenated environments, so you won't find them in lakes as often. And they're great tra trout bait, and they bass love them as well. So I talked about bioindicators, but this is a very specific uh, measurement that aquatic entomologists will use to measure water quality. And it's known as EPT, or the three orders that I've discussed, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera. These three orders are the most sensitive to water quality. Any sort of pollutant will cause their numbers to drop. And their abundance and diversity can be directly tied to the quality of the water. And that's what they use to measure it. They measure the abundance of these insects and the diversity of species that they find in an environment. The healthier an environment, the more of these species are willing to uh, inhabit and survive in those areas. So a lower EPT value, lower diversity, and a lower abundance of these insects usually indicates a very low water quality. Next, we have Coleoptera. Uh, these are known as beetles. Coleoptera actually means sheath wing. You'll see that um, a lot, if not all beetles, have a pair of wings concealed under their elytra or the hard shell that covers their wings. Now, they're very diverse. They have a lot of different families that inhabit the water. And uh, some of these insects, if not most of them, will actually remain underwater as adults. A lot of these larvae can actually be water breathers, while the adults will capture air and still fly around in order to disperse to other areas. In the top right, we have what's known as a riffle beetle. Their larvae are obligately aquatic, and the adults actually spend most of their life underwater as well. If you saw that, if I saw that, I might think that's a normal beetle. There's a very specific identification that you have to do on it if you don't find it in the water. And in the bottom right, we have the water scavenger beetle, the same beetle larvae that had predated that back swimmer that we talked about earlier. Next, we have hemiptera. Hemiptera means half wing because if you look at most true bugs, you'll see that their top wing actually has half of a shell on it or a hemolytra. This is like half of a protective covering on their top wing, and it's sort of similar to beetles. They have a large number of families that are exclusively aquatic. There are no other species in the family that do not inhabit the water, and they are mostly predaceous or scavengers. A lot of them will feed on live or dead insects. A lot of them will predate uh, vertebrates like fish or occasionally rodents that fall in the water. Some of them will feed on plant material, but you don't often find them feeding on detritus because their mouth parts are incompatible. True bugs have a siphon-like mouth part or a beak that they puncture into a substrate in order to feed on it like a single fang. And most of them are obligate air breathers. I, like I mentioned before, they use the siphons or they have the air capture modifications under their wings or on their underside in order to breathe underwater. 
Next we have Diptera. This is a very interesting group of insects with a large diversity of different families and habitats that they will live in. Uh, the larvae are usually maggot shaped. Uh, you might often come across an aquatic true fly and not know that it's a true fly. Maybe it's just a piece of aquatic snot. A lot of them have a tube-like siphon. If you look in the bottom right, you'll see a rat tail maggot. This is actually a hoverfly larvae that can live in low quality water or sewage. A lot of these dipterans can live in sewage due to their modifications, uh, particularly uh, moth flies, if you've ever seen uh, sewage filter flies, or these uh, rat tail maggots, and occasionally net wing midges and other things like that. Um, they're very interesting. They make up a large food source for a lot of different insects, uh, crustaceans, and a lot of fish. Next, we have Megaloptera. Uh, if you've ever been lucky to see a true Dobson fly, you'll know what this is. Or if you know who Coyote Peterson is, he was bitten by the larvae of one of these, known as a Helgramite. Now, they're very interesting creatures. Megaloptera, as you might know, means massive wing. And these insects can be some of the largest known aquatic insect species. They are mostly, if not all, obligately predaceous. And they like to burrow in the soil if they are not crawling around in large grain substrates. They have a very strong bite. You do not want to be bitten by one of these because their mandibles are huge but they're very fun, they're very cool. A fun fact, if you ever try to catch one of these insects and you have a collection going, do not put them in a container with any other insect because they will actively tear them apart. Even if you try to euthanize them in alcohol, they will survive for minutes on end and thrash at anything else in the container, including you. Next we have Lepidoptera. I'm honestly not too familiar with aquatic Lepidoptera. They are usually pretty sparse, but from what I know, they have uh, modified gills on their spiracles, and a lot of them are endophytic, meaning that they live in aquatic plants, and they often, some, they can make cases from plant materials like the catus flies that we've discussed before. Now, some of the individuals are free living, and some of them, as I mentioned, are not. Now, an interesting case is the acentria. Their larvae are endophytic, as I mentioned. They are used in biological control against the invasive Eurasian water milfoil. And they're very interesting. What's most interesting about this, if you see the central photo, this is an adult female acentria. Sometimes the adults, when they emerge, the females will come out wingless. And these females remain in the aquatic environment. They do not leave the body of water that they eat clothes in. And I thought that, that was really interesting. There are some females that still develop wings and disperse in order to produce progeny in other environments but this specific species has obligately aquatic female individuals. Now, I understand I'm speaking to lepidopterists. So looking at this photo, you could probably very easily identify the species of butterfly that we have pictured. But if I asked you what was on the right, would you know? Now, this is a catus fly or Trichoptera. As you all know, Lepidopteran scale wing, they have scales on their wings and that's a very easy way to identify these insects. Now, Trichoptera, the catus flies or haired wing, is a very easy way to distinguish them from Lepidopterans. If you look closely, you can see hairs running along the length of the catus flies wing. Now, 
caddis flies have a very interesting relationship with moths and butterflies. They're, they're what known as sister clads. They both branched off very close in time from a common ancestor. And they both reside in a clad known as amphiasmenoptera or garment wing. And you can see a lot of close similarities between these two orders of insects. When you examine the larvae, uh, the untrained eye might not be able to recognize the differences between these two. Um, but to put it very simply, Lepidopterans have prolegs and their first three body segments are not usually sclerotized. Now there are exceptions to this, but that is the general rule. With Cadis flies, they have one pair of prolegs on their final segment that also usually have hooks and a tuft of setae. The hooks are what allow them to tether to their case that I previously mentioned, or the substrate. And you can see the very clearly outlined sclerotized um, uh, back region of the insect. I also did not mention what sclerotized means for anybody who does not know it. There's chitin in insects, and then there's sclerotin. Chitin is a good substance for creating structure, but it's usually very flexible. When you look at a caterpillar, like the one mentioned in the photo, a lot of that in their body is chitin. It's good for making up skin or very flexible material, but often they need sclerotin in order to harden. And if you'll see the hardened surface of the caddis fly, there is a lot more sclerotin material in their body. Now, to get a little bit more detail into Trichoptera or caddis flies, I've mentioned the adults. But the most interesting part of this order is the larvae. There are 27 families in North America with 14,000 species. They are the most speciose group of any other aquatic insect. And there's three major types. There are case-making caddis flies, which I have mentioned before. They use waterproof silk adhesive in order to create these cases that protect them. And it allows them to move around while being protected by predators and to tether themselves or keep themselves anchored in fast moving waters. There are net spinning larvae. If you look in the bottom right, this is actually a hydrocycid uh, larvae that is spinning a net. A lot of these net spinners will actually live in the riffles, the high velocity waters. And they'll actually use this like a fishing net where they'll catch substrate, they'll catch detritus and small organisms in their net and they will eat anything that comes through. They can be predatory in this manner or they can be scavengers. A lot of them don't care about the difference. They'll eat anything that comes into their net. And a fun fact about these net spinning insects is that a lot of science has been done on them. And one of the coolest things is that as you go further downstream, the further down the stream that you go, the smaller particulates uh, there are going because of the number of net spinning caddis flies at the top. So as you go further down, you'll notice that the nets of these caddis flies have smaller and smaller and smaller grains in order to catch the smaller and smaller particles that have not been caught by other caddis flies. And that's really cool. Uh, lastly, we have free living caddis flies. There's, I believe only one family of free living caddis flies in the United States, but they are very speciose. They have a lot of species and that is Ryacophilidae. There is a Ryacophilid caddis fly pictured in the top right photo. And what they do is they include a silk tether uh, that they attach to a substrate, usually a stone, in order to anchor themselves. And they'll sort of use that like an astronaut tethered to the space station in order to move around without fear of being swept down current where they cannot survive. Now, here's a really interesting case for caddis flies. This is pho the photographed insect is Seraclea fulva. This is a leptocerid or a longhorn caddis fly. And you can actually see it's living in an aquatic sponge. This is a freshwater sponge or spongilla that survives in high oxygen environments, aquatic environments in the United States. And this caddis fly has made 
a case out of the sponge. Now you might think that is detrimental to the sponge, but it is actually a mutual symbiotic relationship. Now, while the caddis fly feeds on the sponge and detaches it from the mother in order to make a case of it, it will actually deposit the sponge when it emerges as an adult. And this sponge is still functional. The sponge is pumping water, it is obtaining nutrients and oxygen as the caddis fly moves around. And it will actually propagate and start a new sponge colony when the caddis fly drops it and emerges. And I thought that was a really interesting point to bring up on these insects. Now, while we're on the topic of sponges, if you ever find aquatic sponges and you wanna see some really cool insects, if you don't find those caddis flies, you might be lucky enough to find these. Now, Neuroptera, you might know better as lacewings or antlions or owl flies, but a little known family are what is known as spongilla flies or Cesiridae. These aquatic larvae parasitize and feed on these freshwater sponges. And pictured in the bottom right is actually their pupil casing. They take about eight hours to spin first this net, this mesh around their pupa. And then they again spin that silk cocoon protecting their pupa. And there's very little explanation as to why they do this aside from protection from predators, but it's also still a very interesting note. So for those of you who are interested, um, enthusiasts of the aquatic realms, I will give some very basic advice on how to find aquatic insects and where to catch them. As I've mentioned before, the most important thing in finding aquatic insects is location. If you are trying to find a flat rock mayfly, you will not find it anywhere but a fast moving riffle. If you want to find a dragonfly larvae, you have to go where they live. Another thing, what is the water quality? Are you going to find these especially sensitive insects in a pond that has petroleum dumped in it? Probably not. What are the natural resources available? Is there a lot of leaf litter that these insects can thrive on? Are there fallen logs that these insects can hide in and live on? What is the substrate? Are the rocks, are they pebbles? Is it cobble or is it gravel? Is it sand? And what's the time of the year? If you're looking for a specific species or if you're looking for a specific order, they may have already emerged. A lot of the adults emerge in the summertime and then they lay their eggs. And if you're going towards the end of the summer, a lot of the larvae may be too small to even see if you go looking. And that's really important. Another thing is using the proper equipment. Without a doubt, the bare essentials are an aquatic D net, that is the net pictured in the top right, a sifting pan. This is not always necessary, but I absolutely recommend it. Usually a pan with a white bottom so you can see very clearly what is going on. Dark surfaces are very hard. To, for these insects to be visible because a lot of them are darkly colored to hide in the substrate. And waterproof boots are highly recommended just so you can protect yourself from anything in the water and keep yourself from getting wet. Now that highly accoladed professor that I mentioned earlier, he always went in in his suit. He's a bit eccentric. The only time he didn't go in in his suit is if he needed to use it for church on Sunday. Some more helpful additions. Storage vials are really helpful. There have been too many times where I was walking along, I saw a beautiful aquatic insect, or I decided to search this pond or stream that I had come across, and I didn't have anything to contain these insects that I had found. Another helpful thing that I've learned recently is sorting. Now, you can see in the bottom right, is an ice tray. And the ice tray has a very neat trick where it allows you to separate all of the insects you collect by their order or family. And that can make it very useful when you're separating them for later. And lastly, polarized sunglasses. Now, they allow you to see through the water. They might not always allow you to see the insects you're looking for, but sometimes there are specific swimmers 
that you might be looking for, or you might be looking for fish that know where these insects are and they're trying to predate them. And that can also be very helpful. Now, another interesting thing is the emergences. As I mentioned, a lot of these aquatic insects emerge and when they are adults, they will fly around, they will disperse, and they will mate and they die. And these are also very interesting insects to catch. You can find mayflies, stoneflies, cadis flies, dragonflies, and damselflies in this way. A lot of the time, these different insects have very specific emergences. Uh, stoneflies and mayflies in particular almost have a calendar. And a lot of fly fishermen will go out on very specific days for very specific species, and they'll use a lure that looks like that species because they know that the fish will be looking for them as well. Um, one trick that you can use are the cast skins. If you look in the photo, you'll see in the center of the photo that is a libellulid dragonfly or a skimmer dragonfly. It is the most common dragonfly family in the United States, or at least in New Jersey. And you'll see that it almost looks alive but it actually crawled out from the water up to the tree and it emerged as an adult. Now, what's important is, especially if you're looking for a specific species of these adult insects, is the timing. Some of these will emerge in the very early morning, some of them will emerge midday, and some of them will emerge at dusk. Now, it, it's important to know when, because if you show up at the wrong time, they may not have emerged yet, or they may have all already emerged and flown away. And that can be really disappointing if you don't know the time. Now for net sampling, uh, this is some really cool information that might help. Uh, if you have a DNet and you can use it, uh, there are very specific techniques that allow you to catch these insects. In lotic water or moving water, you can stick your net into the substrate, you place it perpendicular to the substrate facing the current and you use a saw-like motion to cut into the substrate and move it up. You grab the substrate that you've sawed through, you pick it up and then you throw it into your sifting pan. Another important thing that is very helpful is a net buddy. If you have somebody downstream of you ready to catch any insects that have been disturbed by your sifting, but have gotten away and they're now flowing down current. They can sometimes catch these insects and it's very easy to, to identify these insects without any substrate in the net. Now in lentic water or still water, there, as I said, a lot of them are found on the vegetation. Even the free living swimmers can be found hiding on the vegetation. The best thing, the best technique that I've discovered is to place the net facing upwards at the base of the vegetation. You jab the vegetation so that the climbers or any other insects that are on it, they drop, they instinctively drop. And then you sweep upwards to catch any insects that have fallen. And this is a knockdown technique, similar to if, you're any, if any entomologists are present, they'll know about knockdown sampling in agriculture. And this is a very useful technique. Now, another very fruitful collection technique is rock lifting. As I said, the highest abundance of aquatic insects in moving water will be found in riffles. And these large stones can host up to 20 different species or even more on a single stone. Um, one very important thing is that you need to have strong ankles. I have fallen many times walking on unstable rocks and there is no shame in using a walking stick while going out but you will find some very interesting things on these stones. But most important thing, if I could have a takeaway, if you are interested in collecting these insects is always put the substrate back. Even if you found a lot of insects from this substrate and you think there's nothing left, there's almost always something still in or on it. Do not leave the rocks out, do not leave the soil, do not leave the substrate because those insects are no longer in the water and they will likely die. So it's very important to put the substrate back. And that was my talk. Thank you so much for listening. I have to give a lot of credit to Jan Hamsky. He has provided a lot of the high definition photos of the aquatic insects that I used in my presentation. And you can check out his website 
at lifeinfreshwater.net. Thank you so much for listening. Great job, Jake. <laughs> I know you. the Zoom audience, you can't hear them clap, but I saw a few people put the clapping emoji. Um, so at this time, if anybody has questions for Jake, you guys can put them either in the chat and I can read them off, um, or you could just turn your microphone on and ask whatever is best. Um, so I'll actually start because I had a question while you were presenting, I was thinking about it. Um, do you think it would be possible if someone wanted to like rear, let's say like dragonfly larvae, do you think that would be something that is easily acclimated inside with like the proper equipment and tools or not as easy? It's very possible. Um, dragonflies have the lucky adaptation of living in still water. You don't need moving current. You don't need a water pump in the system. Um, some dragonflies are actually caught as the final stage, the instar of their uh, nymph, and they will actually be reared out. They have these large nets that they place over their inhabiting space so that they can emerge without damaging their wings. But you can actually rear dragonflies in a normal fish tank. I've done this. I had the Cordulogastria dragonfly and it ate everything else in the tank. So if you do have fish, I would not recommend putting dragonflies in the tank. Okay. Now, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 very cool, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, there's, if you wanted to raise mayflies or stoneflies, like I said, their water quality preferences are very particular. Um, there are a number of books though that have been published on rearing these insects and they're very cool. If you talk to Professor Dina Fonseca, she's actually created a, a specific water environment for black flies to live in. She actually did one of her theses on that system. Very cool. <laughs> Um, so just going through uh, the chat, uh, Carrie O'Brien says, so cool. Uh, Jeannie says, very, very thorough and clear presentation. I agree. Uh, Marge says, great talk and best of luck with your further studies. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Jake? Um, I had one, uh, Joyce Clowley here. Um, right, uh, when I lived in my other house uh, before I moved here, um, I, one day suddenly drain flies appeared and I did manage to find the larvae in the sink drain. Um, they were very cute, had black heads and I kind of let them go back in. Um, they seemed so um, unable to fly well. They would just like land on the unfortunate pink tile in my bathroom and they just sit there. And I'm, I was trying to think, how did they ever get in to the bathroom? Do you have any idea of the mechanism they use to, to move from one place to another? It's a very interesting take. Um, a lot of the times they can be pretty inconspicuous when they enter. They'll enter through a window, they'll enter through an open door, and sometimes they can be attracted to the smell of sewage and sometimes they just happen across it. Like I, like I said, the larvae live and feed on sewage that accumulate in pipes. And sometimes these larvae can travel through the back end of the pipe and just make their way up. This is less common, but it is possible. If you are looking for an easy way to remove these drain flies, the best way is to pour boiling water down the drain. Now that's not recommended if you have PVC piping. Uh, and in that case, I usually, uh, Drano can also work. Yeah, I kind of thought of them as pets. Um, <laughs> so oh, I'm sorry. That's just me. <laughs> but they're interesting, you know, suddenly appeared. And I unfortunately don't have any in my new house, but um, oh, well, maybe they'll appear someday. Uh, being a little facetious there. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad that um, you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned. 
Um, does anyone else have any questions for Jake? I'm not seeing any in the chat or anybody raising their hand. I have a I have a question. Oh, go ahead. A lot of us have spent a lot of time um, focusing on dragonflies as aquatic insects. And dragonflies, I understand, uh, have crashed over the last, what, 25 years? And some species are hard to find or aren't, may have actually disappeared from northern New Jersey. And I wondered if you know what, what are the factors that, first of all, whether that's true or whether it's just people's imagination uh, or and what factors would have contributed to a decline? Uh, well, no, that is actually um, a decent um, observation. A lot of people have noticed this decline in insects. It is congruent with the decline of insect species across the world, but dragonflies in some circumstances are specifically affected more. A major contributor is habitat destruction as more property is being developed and these aquatic environments are being removed, there are fewer and fewer places for these dragonflies uh, to inhabit, especially if they require very specific, specific environments. Like I said earlier, the Haganus dragonfly has very specific uh, conditions that it needs to thrive in. Uh, another thing is water quality, like I've mentioned before. Uh, there's a lot of insecticide runoff from agriculture. And while they're not as sensitive to water quality as the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies are, they are certainly susceptible to pollution as well. Thank you. No problem. Um, to a message in the chat uh, from Karen, sometimes in the middle of the summer, dragonflies appear in my backyard. We don't have a water source nearby. Why? So that's interesting. Um, dragonflies have two major stages of behavior when they emerge. They, when they emerge, they'll disperse up to um, a mile away in search of food. And usually on their way back, they'll find a pond or a stream or they'll move back to their original pond. And you'll see the dragonflies have that very defensive behavior. They're sort of like lions or other dominant animals that will fight for territory. But there may be some sort of visual cue that hinted at the dragonfly to find its way into your backyard. A lot of reflective material, um, like weed barriers in farms, if it's a clear like cellophane material, or even a windshield on your car, a dragonfly will see that and go, oh, that's water. And it will actually attract them in that way. But if you see them in your backyard, you don't have any of those indicators, it might just be that you have a high diversity of prey insects in your backyard that they are looking to feed on. I'm just looking for any other questions. I don't see any, so I'm just going to stop recording.